Hello, and welcome back once again to the Inquisitor podcast with me, Marcus Kauke. My guest today is Chris Prangley. He's the author of Tech Sales War- The Tech Sales Warrior. Um, and today we're going to be looking at some blind spots, like um, you know, when deals seem to be too good to be true. You know, the truth about RFPs, when to go for them, when not to, when they're real and when they're bogus. Understanding that a great deal is only a great deal if you understand what the prospect's real pain is and why they would be motivated to change because 60% of buying cycles end up in the status quo. That's your biggest competitor. We're going to look at how you can accelerate deals and whether you should. What are you missing in deals? Have you uh, covered all the bases with legal, paperwork? Have you made sure everybody who needs to be involved is involved? And if you're a manager, how can you help your team achieve their targets and uh, meet the metrics? So, Chris, welcome. Thank you, Marcus. Glad to be here. Excellent. Would you mind giving us 60 to 90 seconds on your history, please? Yes, yes. And uh, to keep it short, I'll, I'll focus on the last decade. I broke into the world of software sales, cybersecurity, actually through LinkedIn. Someone had mentioned uh, this startup in New York City, and uh, there was a lot of high regard for them, what they were doing in the early days. And after many, many interviews, I got in and I got in as a, a TDR, BDR, SDR, whatever you want to call it, cold calling away which led to uh, a, a role on the inside commercial team, eventually to an enterprise field seller, eventually to the regional director managing several enterprise sellers, then to a senior director covering part of the country, and now uh, VP of sales on the West covering a bunch of teams, right? So it's been a heck of a ride and each role has been so awesome in the journey and so valuable. I, if it's I could- All in the same company. All in the same company. Right. Yeah. Okay. In that case, I'm going to take a slightly different tack on this one because uh, <laughs> this could be really interesting. Okay. So that early stage where it was just you, a phone, and a lot of hope. What was it like when the company started to really scale and it was a different company every three months? What was living through that like? Very exciting, riveting. I will say initially way less tools. And so uh, when we first were prospecting, a lot of it outside of like call lists and whatnot was manual. A lot of manual dials. I love manual dials, actually. I found that I got a lot of connects that way. And then eventually a lot of automation came in and helped um, to a point where really any tool at your fingertips, which is amazing. But I think once you get to the point of, of a mature company and have all those resources, as a seller, you really need to identify which tools are important to you and use and actually use them. You want to be, <laughs> you'd be amazed how many sellers I talk to don't even know that they have this amazing tool that costs significant uh, amounts of money that someone would be dying to use and it's just sitting on the shelf. So that then brings me to the next question. As the tech stack starts to build, what do you have to do to make sure that it doesn't just turn into this technology spaghetti and it starts creating friction and becomes a deal prevention exercise rather than actually helping salespeople sell? Yeah, I think it all goes back to your mission and your process. So one of the things I talk about in the book is start with why, and it's a concept we all know, but few of us embrace in really understanding what am I here to do every single day? Not just my metrics, but why am I doing this? And I think if you first understand that, that will put all the pieces in place. And then it's about time management. What am I doing and why am I doing it? not just to use technology, but to use it to achieve the outcomes. The most effective people I know do exactly that. They take the tools that they have available to them and they use them for the mission, for the role. There were times I can say when when technology was first deployed that folks were like, hey, use this. No one knew the effectiveness of it, right? And and eventually it, it Sometimes it was very positive. In other ways, it was like, hey, this isn't working, right? So that can get in the way of booking meetings or closing deals. So 
you do need to monitor that. I think it's harder when a company is in the startup phase and doing that because you may not have that data yet or know the impact you learn on the fly. So, so as a manager, what technology stack do you need in order to support your people to do their best work? No, that's a loaded question, Marcus. I think at the the minimum, ideally, definitely a CRM of some sorts, just to be able to uh, have accurate data, track data. I think at the minimum, definitely accurate call lists to be able to, you know, easily research companies and and find data quickly. If you don't have that information and you're having your teams waste a lot of time researching, I think you know, you, you're, you're basically paying people to research way more than you could just pay a service and, and be efficient with your time. Marcus, we talked about some, some companies, depending on size, may benefit from an outsourcing model in terms yeah. of like booking meetings. I think that's really going to depend on the company size. And then outside of that, of course, you need the basics, you need the cell phone, you need the laptop. Now, in all of that, right, I haven't mentioned there's dozens of other new technology that's come out over the past decade, even the past year and a half, that greatly help. Things like ways to track emails and, and ways to deploy marketing materials in a way that you can understand if customers are leveraging them. But at the minimum, I would say those things. You know, I think any great sales team that truly knows you know, what they're selling, the reason why they're selling it. If you have those things, you can go out and sell. All the other things help with efficiencies. Now I'm all about efficiencies. I love them, but don't ever like let efficiencies get in the way of you selling, right? Or And, and this is my, the reason for my question, because what I've seen time and again is people invest in tech uh, in the belief it's going to drive efficiency, but what they sacrifice is effectiveness because mm-hmm. people seem to forget that the reason we're investing in these technologies is because we want salespeople to sell more. Same thing with training, same thing with having managers, same thing with recruiting more salespeople. We want more sales. But that outcome seems to be forgotten somewhere along the way because then it becomes a matter of trying to track metrics instead of, is this actually helping my salespeople to sell more more often for more money more frequently to more people? And by and large, the answer to that, in my experience, is no. And what it does is it creates more friction, it creates more workload, more bureaucracy. And I'm not, you know, the, the evidence is out there, but the results are not. And I wonder when you have nine and a half thousand tech companies just focused on the, uh, the MarTech and sales enablement space, plus all the, you know, the consultants and coaches and trainers, there are more of them than flies. Endless, all, endless. <laughs> yeah, yeah, people like you and I feeding on this trillion dollar a year market. And what I'm convinced of is no one has solved the problem because they're all f- trying to fix symptoms and they're all trying to fix their little bit because they're not looking at the bigger picture, which is what the customer has to look at. And very few salespeople look through the lens of the customer at their problem and what they're trying to accomplish and their struggling moments and the jobs that they're trying to get done. So uh, as a tech sales warrior, I'm really curious to understand how you made sure that you had that kind of understanding and insight before you committed hundreds of thousands of dollars of company resources in a pointless pursuit. Yeah, I, I, it's so this this concept of why and aligning to your mission, aligning to the company mission, it, it's so critical because it, it opens your eyes to what's needed, right? And what you're doing. Uh, this this point you're bringing up, Marcus, with the the business pain. To me, you first have to understand that whether you're going into a first meeting, whether you're making if it's a cold call or a warm call, or you're working with a partner to try to get a meeting at the most minimum. You have to understand who you're reaching out to, who they are, what they focus on, what their company is, what do they do, how do they make money? Did you read their 10K or did you see on their business site that they're struggling with some things? Have you looked at their name in the news to see if there's any articles that pop up or have you seen any of their leaders recently give talks? Understanding your customer and understanding what they're going through. You may not know all the information right away and that's fine but at least showing up 
with some information that you've done your homework. And then in that meeting or in that call, or maybe it's a, a couple minutes together in an elevator, you understand that'd be a long elevator ride. You understand really what they're struggling with and you attack it from that angle. Going back to the top of the, the question, when we're talking about metrics, I think being effective in your role, if we look at it from a sales rep's perspective, what I would do and what helped really change my career is every day I sent myself a daily report. And it was on the outcomes of my activity, not what I did, not so much how many cold calls did I make, how many emails did I make, how many, you know, LinkedIn navigate, whatever it may be. What was effective? Right, right results. Good Lord. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, the same thing I, I say to managers, you know, leading teams, not just being a manager, but leading coaching is if you find your team every day in the same place, we need to help figure out what part of the sales cycle is breaking down. Because if every day it's zero, we have a problem. And just saying, hey, you're at zero, that's not going to help anyone. So is it in their list? Is it in their outreach? Can they not overcome obstacles? Is it the times that they're reaching out? Is it they don't understand the product or how to overcome things? There's so many pieces of this that a leader needs to break down versus a manager may just look at a sheet and say, hey, you know, you got zero today, you got zero next day. It doesn't help anyone. Well, th th this again then speaks to so many issues. The first thing is if we look at the management layer, a manager has two primary functions in my book, hire the best people and then get the best out of them. If you hire the best people, 95, 98% of your management problems go out the window. Sometimes you have to deal with a bit of prima donna, but it, it's better than more of the many of the other problems you're going to have to deal with. And then get the best out of them. That means they have to have the tools and resources they need to do their best work every day. They need the right training. They need the right support. They need the right mechanisms. They need accountability. They need coaching, heaven forbid. There was a study that uh, Sandra did um, a couple of years ago. 78% of managers were convinced they were coaching, but only 18% of their salespeople said they received any coaching at all, um, which is, yeah, that is <laughs> oh, a man. little gap. Um, yeah. So uh, again, in terms of how you develop your managers, I'd be really curious about that because it sounds to me like there was career progression for you. And I'd be curious what you're doing to give that back to the next generations. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll start first with uh, with sales reps. You know, when I started taking over teams, of course, I would share process. And I think if we, number one, you got to have the why, right? If you don't have the why, let's not even talk. The next step is we need to have a process. What's your process day to day, week by week to achieve success? It's a basic concept, but when you drill into this with many folks, they're not doing it. And that's really the basis of the book is, a lot of folks would reach out to me, go, what's your secret? You're on stage every year. What's your secret? What's your secret? And I go, you ready? There's no secret. <laughs> There's a process. Yeah. And literally, I break it down in a book, but it's, it's common concepts that we all know. It's just implementing it. So one of the things that evolved from this over time is I know we all know role play. Some people love it. Some people hate it. But where, where I found role play to be... <laughs> What's that? Practice. It's practice. It's you, practice. You, it is practice. Yes. If you went to a surgeon and they hadn't practiced your open heart surgery or your brain surgery, you would worry. We, we're just about to go in and ask you to part with $20 million and buy a system that's going to affect every part of your organization, your customers, your supply chain, your people. And you want me to turn up unprepared? Yeah, it's 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 crazy. So one of the things, and I'd recommend this to all you know, frontline managers, I would build these case studies. It'd probably take me you know, an hour to build these things, give a backstory of a, a fictional company. I'd actually relate it to a deal, but make up all the names. The sellers in the room, I would give them a title. Maybe it's uh, the CISO, CIO. You know, I focus a lot in, in uh, cybersecurity, so I'm using those titles. And then within the room, 
within those titles, like the CISO or the CIO, they may know things unique to them, like the other person in the room doesn't know. So it's a true workplace dynamic. And the seller comes into the room, literally walks into the room as if it's a boardroom meeting in person. And I have the rest of the team sitting there watching. And I pulled this concept, this is kind of wild, back in the day, I was, I was in drama. It's a, it's a very common technique used to learn in drama schools. And so you see what unfolds before you, a live meeting. And it's wild to see all the nuances. And I think if you do it enough, you can actually pull out the gaps in a unique seller's uh, day-to-day process. And from there, the the whole concept, you got to make sure that, hey, guys, this is a fail, fail zone. Everyone's failing. We're doing this together. You can't allow anyone to like put anyone down in those meetings. It's all about building up as a team. So when they get in those situations, exactly like you said, Marcus, they're ready. They're not making those excuses. And we go, by the way, those meetings, we go hard, right? Yeah, we're, yeah. we're, you know, there's, this is it's not. It's harder to sell yeah. that during the red, uh, the red team rehearsal than it ever will be in front of the customer. Exactly. Exactly. That, so, it's like, it's like putting a, uh, an indoor plant outside. You season it. The rehearsal is where you practice and you live all the moments so that you don't have to make it up on the spot. Because there's a really good reason for this. If you've rehearsed it and lived it, and you know what's coming next, then you're not panicking. The moment you start to panic, your amygdala gets fired off, and you move into freeze, flight, or fight. That's an idiotic place for any salesperson to ever let themselves get into. And lack of practice normally puts you into that place. That's why you give away money, and you leave it on the table. Yeah, I I just... I've seen this common thing across organizations where a seller comes on, right? They get, they get their gifts in the beginning. It's all, Hey, exciting. They do a very basic training. Then they're thrown in the field Mm -hmm. and whether they're seasoned or not, you need to get in there and practice. And we all know, you know, practice makes perfect, but also how you practice impacts. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. So yeah, it it helped those teams a lot. A lot of those uh, folks that have been in those classes have gone on and become, you know, consistent quota crushers, eventually have become leaders in it, their own right. Now, flipping to the manager side, what I've found to be one of the things, and it, it once again, it seems like a basic concept, but having managers adjust to the seller's personality mm. and truly understand them seems to be not always a thing that folks understand. How can I serve this unique individual and what they're trying to achieve, what they're strong at, and also how I relate to them and coach lead them. Sometimes folks are treating them as the same same seller. And that (laughs) that does not work. So that would be one of the biggest things. And then, you know, there's this big term, culture. And culture, I believe, is built day in, day out. It's it's how you treat folks. It's also how you treat your day-to-day and what you expect. And uh, the frontline manager has a huge impact on that. I think much greater than what we hear at a company level. Oh, that company is great. They have great culture. I think that's built on the ground. Of course, there's concepts and whatnot that the company must believe in that can impact the culture, no doubt about it. But when you're a frontline manager, I love the role, love doing that. You're there in the trenches with your team. And I think your ability to create that culture, it's so powerful. It's in your hands and it can slip right by if you don't own it. And this is why I think the middle management layer is the single biggest untapped latent resource within almost every organization and every management a function, not just in sales. Interestingly enough, because I've been look, observing these problems for years, I've been going out and uh, finding solutions. So there are a couple of solutions that are really management solutions that uh, catalyze that middle management layer to move from a command and control type of management style to one that is inquiry led and on the job, in the moment, operational coaching at the point of need then backed up by a technology that fits on your phone. And I, as the manager, can say to you, Chris, I noticed that uh, when we talked about the price increase to Bob, you choked a little bit. 
So let's practice that skill. And then I can issue instructions specifically on the behavior. You then record it. But what's interesting is they record four or five times before they save it. So they become more self-aware of the car crash that's them in front of the customer. And that's priceless. And once they've uploaded it, I can then uh, give feedback as the coach or the manager at a time that's convenient to me. Now, interestingly enough, about 60% of all these videos are done from the car. So whilst they're waiting to go to, into a meeting, they do the video. The coach then can coach back. And you go back and forth until they perfect it. Now I can take that and use that as a best practice video with your permission. I can say, Chris, do you mind if we use this as best practice? And I can use that in the recruitment process to test coachability. I can use it in pre-onboarding to get people up to speed. I can use it on the onboarding. And I can use it as a way of avoiding having people delegate up to me as the part of the three before me. When you come to me with a problem, I want you to try to tried three ways to fix it. Well, if I have an archive of all this stuff and it's properly indexed, you can go there and then you can fix it yourself because I don't want to create learned help systems. Now, I can also shadow coach because I, as the trainer or the VP, can then coach you as the manager to, when you're coaching Fred and I can see that and then I can give you third-party feedback. So you've That's got great. this incredible, yeah, it's wonderful. So you combine that with being able to change the management layer behavior simultaneously and practice the skill. It's incredible. That's awesome. Do you, when you're giving these exercises, is there a way to add a real world element? Like the, the point you mentioned about pricing, right? I see it all the time live in the field. And then I, I typically will give coaching after. But when you're doing these exercises, which, by the way, highly recommend video, audio, so people can really see how they come across in meetings, how are you adding in the element of like a real meeting, right? So Everything is done by you as the manager in the real world based on the example here is one of our clients for that is an FMCG manufacturer. Uh, they produce uh, smoothies and they produced a, a range of cold soups and they were struggling to sell these to the buyers because the buyers were saying, well, we love your smoothies, but your, you don't exist in this category. Why am I going to blow a hundred grand uh, of this stuff for it to go off on my shelves? So they struggled with that. And at the product launch, everybody hit quota because they practiced all of those different scenarios because it's about taking moments in the sale. It might be just 30 seconds or two minutes and practicing those because they don't need the whole thing. It's just that little bit that you, Chris, struggled with because as a manager, you coach what you see. That's so good. It's, it's, uh, it's something I've seen witness myself. So that's awesome to hear. So this is, this is your program, Marcus, or? Uh, it's, it's one of the companies I'm a fractional CRO for a company called Mobile nice. Practice. And then the other one that does the uh, the management performance improvement transformation is called Notion Limited. I'll introduce Very you cool. if you want. Very cool. This is really interesting because as I look through the book, what I noticed is some really interesting points that you make, one of which is there is no I in quota and no one hit quota in a day. So can you speak to both of those? Because I think it's really important that people understand the importance of cooperation and playing nicely with others. Yeah, I, I think, you know, if you, if you want to become this seller who is closing large accounts and also becoming a consistent closer, and we're talking about sizable quotas here, you know, several million dollars. Not, I'm not talking about, you know, $10,000 here, right? So, or pounds, whatever you want, or euros, right? Mm -hmm. So, it's really about leveraging your resources. And even at the smallest startups, there's so many folks, you know, I've, I've talked to sellers who, you know, team of 80 or so, they're having to pull in legal counsel or sometimes even product development to help close a deal. All goes back to this concept of, first off, you don't have to be on your own in this island when you're selling, but also thinking about all the folks that you can deploy and leverage as tools to close a deal. And not just in a way of like, hey, here I am closing, but that it is a team effort. 
And this concept that which has been around forever, win together, lose together, right? But when you bring that concept to the forefront of your selling, I don't know, in, in my opinion, you feel more supported. You also are more just effective in your in your role. Well, this is really interesting because what I've seen in all the superstar sellers, and I mean, these are the, the top 0.1 percenters that I've met, and I've been fortunate to meet quite a few. Without exception, they are decent human beings. They humble. They are fantastic at driving discretionary effort from other people who have no particular vested interest in the outcome. They are really good pro project managers. They're organized. They orchestrate things. They're choreographers. And they understand that they are captain of the sale, everyone else's crew. And their job is to make sure they choreograph the right conversations between the right people at the right time and make sure that they happen in the right order. And then they bring everything together. Because to, to my mind, this kind of sale is 90% project management and 10% psychiatry. It's, that's exactly right. And in the States, I usually say you're the QB, the quarterback, which is exactly the same concept, whether it's the composer, the architect. Yeah, it really is that. And going back to one point, you know, and this is more for the early, early sellers, the, the newer sellers. I get it when you're first coming into the game, sales is a very lucrative industry and you can lean on all the money that can be made and get excited by that stuff. But eventually in time, you'll learn like that's in the aftermath. And if you're you get good at your craft, that will just be something that, that comes along with it. The I'm getting to this point of the leading top, you know, 1% of sellers, this humbleness, this, it's not necessarily about the money, but the value delivery, because the money comes. And the money is a really, byproduct of doing, yeah. of helping other people get their needs met and delivering the better future that they paid you for. Exactly. And I think exactly what you're saying with the composer, the architect, it's just that you have this seller who understands it really is a complicated uh, sport. And there's so many resources, so many other talents that you can deploy to help you solve the problem. And when we solve the problem, yeah, money comes. It's just the aftermath, right? So, yeah. There is a really fundamental principle that put humanity to the top of the food chain, which is our ability to cooperate and learn when to let someone else lead and when to take the lead. And if you look at tribal societies like the Maasai, they have leaders in every generation and they have leaders for different things. So leaders for defending their cattle against neighboring tribes, against uh, predatory animals, for changes in the weather, for foraging, for uh, driving the cattle, for dealing with social issues. And People lead because that is their strength and they know when to step back. And one of the things that I see time and time again getting in the way is ego. So how did you learn that whilst your ego has its place, the moment you let it control you, then that's pretty much game over. What was your moment when uh, you realized uh, that you had to keep it in check? One of the influences for me is, you know, a lot of philosophy, a lot of these self-help books. I know people are like, self-help, no. But uh, in my early 20s, I was obsessed with it. And I, I think ultimately it builds a foundation of just getting in the right, right mindset. And ego is one of the things that's often called out as something that gets in the way. When it relates to sales, you know, initially ego is what empowered me. Because you know, you're at the bottom of the, the chain when you're coming in as TDR, SDR, BDR. But once you understand the value of what you, you bring, that changes things. In a sales meeting, where I learned this is I just saw exactly what you just mentioned about the tribes and how there's different leaders for different roles. I just saw that there was leaders above me who were very precise and efficient with their words and excellent at what they did, whether it was from a process approach that they shared in a meeting, or whether it was a very technical response, or whether it was an executive leader talking about company mission and values. I just saw that those folks were better than me in those 
categories, right? My strength at the time for when I was a seller and the specific meeting I'm thinking of was really creating the meeting, orchestrating the meeting, getting people in the room, setting up the business problem, but then very precise delegating who was doing what in a meeting. Of course, we had rehearsals and stuff before. It's just, it goes back to exactly this whole, you know, there's no I in quota. It's understanding that there's so many great resources and tools and you don't have to be the only one. You don't have to be, it's not all on your shoulders. And understanding that is really what what got me to, hey, back the ego up a little bit. Now, hey, when a big deal closed, uh, when I was an enterprise seller, am I all, you know, about the ego? Yes. But if you look into that deal and how many times your sales engineer or your manager or the technical team or the R and D or the legal, you have to back up and be like, man, a lot of people helped on this. I, you know, I'm thankful for those folks. And again, that's another quality that you see in the top performers, gratitude, the gratitude, they're willing to give the credit. And that that's again, something that the culture of sales, I think, has really done away with in many cases. But you you look at those leaders. I look at someone like Tom Shodorf, who took Splunk from 10 million to 1.3 billion in five years. And uh, you know, 15 years or 10, 10 years later, he's still loved by the people who were three, four, five layers beneath him because he really cared. And you know, I, I've been fortunate to have interviewed those sorts of leaders on the podcast. And without exception, there is a, a real purpose about them and a real sense of service. And they treat people well. So my, my question is this, because I have a real bee on my bonnet about this. There's uh, people who've listened to the podcast may have heard. But I'm curious. I hear the outgoing generation of leadership bemoan the incoming generation as being entitled and expecting everything on a plate and so on. But I don't think it's bloody unreasonable to expect your employer to create a safe environment and to have managers who look after your welfare and want the best for you and to have co-workers who have high work standards and the ethics of the business are that you don't lie to customers for selfish self-interest you don't bully and manipulate, uh, you don't exploit people, which is also known as burnout. And I think all of those are perfectly reasonable expectations. And my question is this, why is it that so few managers and leaders make that their mission to create that kind of environment where they are a destination employer, where employees feel fully engaged and love coming to work? And instead, they treat them like a commodity to be used and abused. Hmm. It's a loaded one, Marcus. Why folks do it, I don't know. You know, I think we'll have to ask them one off. But I, I think uh, we spoke about in the past, you know, there's there's this old culture of sales. You know, you, you think of the boiler room type environments and, and some of it was lauded as, oh, but we know, you know, not so great for the customer and probably not so great for the human either. It takes work, right? Uh, not everyone wants to do the work. It's easy to talk about closing a deal. It's hard to build a culture and hard to build a place that people feel valued every day, even though we have all these metrics and everything's going on and something may happen, but it takes effort. And it goes all back to the principles and whatnot. In the book, I talk about when you're looking for the seller, when you're looking for a company, first identify what it is you are, like what your why is, why you're doing this, right? You also then want to look for companies that are solving a mission that excite you and their principles excite you. And is every day going to be perfect? No, every day is not going to be perfect. But when you have those two things aligned, I think that's the starting point, right? And then from there, this is once again, where the frontline manager comes in, they can create almost a family in a, in a way. Do you have to be buddy, buddy with everyone? No, but that place where people feel empowered, they feel valued, they want to come to work, they're inspired versus do your job, show up here, you know? One other point you mentioned earlier about 
you know, just sales and opportunity. This is also in the book. We are given such an opportunity in this field, especially in the tech sales field. And there's a lot of other medical devices, another great one, ad sales where you can make so much money and with that money create such an impact in your communities, your family, your friends, et cetera. The other aspect of this with the, with the newer generation is what lies before you is an incredible opportunity. Do you understand that? Are you embracing that? The final, final piece of this is look, I, I see Younger sellers, some of them come in with the entitled mindset, like, hey, I'm I'm fresh out of school. I want to make 150 G's minimum. And it's like, <laughs> come on, you gotta be, you know, it gotta be reasonable. What is the word reasonable? I don't know, but there's some of that. But on the flip of that, there's an apprenticeship. You got to learn, you got to earn it. It doesn't happen yeah. overnight. So that's the one area I see sometimes like the earning piece is missing. Like, hey, I don't want to earn it. I just want to go right to it. We all had to earn it. It's just, it's the reality. You have to work through it and earn it and you'll eventually get there. So I see that sometimes. But on the flip of that, I've also seen incredibly focused, disciplined, dedicated young folks coming into the industry and they, they want to be the top. They want to earn it. So there's a mix of it. It may just be a communication breakdown, Marcus. It may just, you know. Well, look, but my, my point was really about, I think, as leaders and as managers and as founders, we have an obligation to think and behave differently to prior generations. Because if we want to attract and keep real talent, then we have to create the environment that they want to come to work in. And you're seeing it at the moment. You're seeing this mass migration of people out of this boiler room type of uh, sales environment, people not wanting to go back, starting up on their own side hustles. You know, 40% of salespeople are predicted to have a side hustle this year. That makes every one of those a flight risk. You better be looking after your people. And yeah. uh, if you want your salespeople to look after your customers, look after your people. Don't treat them like crap. Uh, stop burning them out. Stop them. Um, you know, what, one of the questions we were going to touch on is, you know, how can I accelerate a deal? Well, very often I see management pulling deals forward that they shouldn't. They're only pulling it forward to feed a, a private valuation that is out of date by dinner time. And the pressure that creates and the waste is just horrific. So what I'd like to understand, are we accelerating deals for the right reasons or are we doing it to try and serve our own pocketbook? It's a great point. And I think a little complicated. So in terms of accelerating deals, you know, when I when I view the word accelerating deals, I'm trying I'm focusing really on efficiency of deal. Not so, so much. Expected. Yeah, not not so much about sabotaging a deal, destroying a deal to pull it in, but yeah. more how can we have a deal close as quick as possible in its best form that we're not in the way of the deal. Maybe right. we're slowing that's it down. A, that's with a our much better question. Right. Yeah. So I have seen the other side, right? Where it's, hey, need a, need this, cut it in half, bring it in, or like sell half the thing. And that's that's rough. That's rough for the customer. That's rough for the seller. Um, I think there's better ways to do that. One of the ways I think from a sales, you know, if you're a seller and you're in these situations. It's going to sound very basic, but more prospecting, more opportunities. And not just the concept of more, 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 but having enough where it's staged and you have such detailed notes on your accounts that you can stand by them and not be kind of put in this position where it's like, hey, chop that deal in half, bring it in now, you know? The, the reason most salespeople have to comply with this shit is because they don't have enough in the pipeline because they avoided prospecting 12, 18, 24 yeah. weeks ago. Right. What you don't do today, you will pay for tomorrow. It's as simple as that. That's the only bit of the numbers game that I agree with. To be honest, I would much rather work with a smaller group of accounts with a smaller number of deals that are bigger uh, with a higher probability of closing faster for more money. And then they come back and renew and bring their friends. To me, that's a way more intelligent way of selling. And I think what yeah. is missing, uh, David Prima is the, uh, the person who advocates this the best, that sales is a cerebral activity. And I think that the intelligence in sales has gone in favor of transactional selling. 
And what we should be doing is teaching salespeople how to think intelligently so they can be lazy at the right time. You put a lot of effort in to building the foundations, doing your research, so that when you're in front of the customer, you can just chill. I mean, mm-hmm. I, for, for me, a sales meeting is like a meditation. By the way, I love sales meetings. So I'm working on a I'm working on another book on it right now. You know, we talk about the prospecting, and and you echo my my belief exactly. If you're not prospecting every day and filling that funnel, then it's going to eventually bite you. But here's part two: once you get that meeting, do you actually <laughs> take advantage of the salary. opportunity, yeah. or is it burned? It goes back to your coaching points too. Seven you know, out of eight it, first meetings yeah. don't result in a second. You turn up and you yeah. waste it. Idiot. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I know we're jumping around a bit. The uh, the other thing with uh, this, you know, the migration or folks with a side hustle. You know, I've I've worked with a, tons of reps, and this this side hustle. By the way, I love the fact that people have side hustles and whatnot, and as long as it doesn't distract from your main thing. Here's here's the issue I have with it more in with uh, tech sales, which I've seen is. Folks talk about, oh, this side hustle, I got this thing going on. And instead of focusing their efforts on what they could do in their role and absolutely crush it, they get these dreams and ambitions of like a get rich quick scheme on the side, whereas their peers who are these, the humble 1%, whatever that are crushing it are making five, 10 X what they make if they just focus. focus. And and this there, other there is an old the, Confucian proverb: "Man who rides two horses end up with very sore crotch." <laughs> oh yeah, that that could be a scary one. This other concept too, you know, back I don't know where it ever came. Maybe it's the used car salesman or whatever it may be of like sales being dirty. But it goes back to what you mentioned too with the top sellers coming across as valued. You know, really trying to solve customer pain. In my view, sales is a very noble thing. And when you're solving these massive pains, people pay for that. And if we get more and more folks early in their career understanding that it is a noble profession, it is an amazing profession, it's so cool. You have so many hats that you can wear, detective, consultant, the doctor, you're still selling, right? But there's, there's all these ways you can impact your communities, your firms, the world, if you believe it and understand that. This is not just about getting on a phone and trying to get someone else's money. Chris, we have to wrap up because you have another meeting now. But if you had one golden ticket and you can go back and whisper in the ear of the idiot Chris, age 23, what one bit of advice would you give him that he would have ignored? (laughs) Okay, there's two. Trust your gut, always trust Mm -hmm. your gut. And then the other is for whatever you want to accomplish, put a daily process and habit in place and you will accomplish it. Stick to that process. Habits and behavior, that will outsmart talent any day of the week. Talent works best if you have process and consistency. So uh, Chris, how can people get hold of you? LinkedIn is a great way. You could find me on TechSalesWarrior.com. And the book is live on Amazon as well. TechSalesWarrior.com. Highly recommend Yeah. Excellent. So, Chris Prangley, thank you. Thanks so much, Marcus. So, this is Marcus Kauke signing off once again from the Inquisitor podcast. If you found this useful and insightful, please like, comment, share, and tag someone who could do with a listen. And if you feel the urge, go over to Apple Podcasts and leave an honest review. One, two, three, four or five stars. Don't care which, just tell the truth. In the meantime, stay safe and happy selling. And if you want me, Marcus at laughsiphonlast.com. Bye-bye.